Um, you already mentioned uh, the recording uh, of the well of of a few songs in, in with friends of yours yeah. in uh, New York. Yeah. Um, there must have been a really special occasion because you recorded seven songs in one day. Well, it was just it was more to do with how good they were. I mean, they those guys are such great musicians. They just I showed up. I was able to stand right in front of a microphone just like it was here and I said this song is in D and the guys got it and there they it was really really kind of shocking to play with musicians with such confidence you know because I'd been used to I've been playing for 20 years in the frames and the frames are great and when the frames go on stage there's no other band I want to be in when we are standing and looking at each other we get it we just we have a a connection and I love making records with those guys too but I guess, I guess after 20 years with a bunch of friends, maybe, maybe, maybe we all stop and we stop kind of surprising each other. Yeah. You know, maybe they're not so surprised by my songs when I bring them in. Maybe I'm not so surprised by how someone plays along to it. So there was, there's a comfort with the frames and it's, it's a very important comfort and uh, there's no one else I'd rather play on stage with. But in terms of being in the studio and trying to find something within the song, these guys brought something very natural to it immediately that I was surprised by and excited by. So yes, we recorded seven songs that first day. Now, I think on the record maybe there's four or five of those that one that first day. And then of course we went in and we did more. Uh, and we did a couple of songs again and tried them. But that first day was a real eye-opener. I was. I was hugely impressed with what came out and I lived with it for a couple of weeks and it was only after a couple of weeks I sort of said, I think I'd like to finish this and turn it into something and maybe call it a Glen Hansard. I was like, would I call it a Glen Hansard? And then I thought about maybe calling it another band. I was like, maybe I'll make up another band name and I thought, you know, maybe it's time. Maybe it's time for me to just put my own name on it and because and it's less confusing. At least my name is associated with the frames and the swell season so it's not such a jump to, uh, to call it, you know, my but name. What did they bring? Is there, do you have an example of a song that they, well, that they changed a bit that you said, well, they really surprised me? Uh, yeah, I mean, a good example would be Talking to the Wolves, uh, the third song. Um, that's Brian Devendorf from The National. And Brian came in and, you know, we had a few songs and Brian's playing is very specific. The National sound is very much based around his, it's, it's kind of like that Joy Division that's his, you know, that's his thing. I was asking him to do something more like and he can do it, but it just wasn't, I could feel it from him that he wasn't, that wasn't his thing. His thing was and so even though the recordings he, he played on were just beautiful, I decided, what do I have anything that maybe he could do what he's best at on. And so I had this little idea, this boom, down, boom, down, boom, boom, down, boom, down. And I started playing it and he just immediately went boom, doop, boom, boom, doop, boom, boom. And it was like, okay, perfect, we've got a thing. And so I didn't have a song, I had an idea. Yeah. And so he pushed it from a song, from an idea to a song, just by, by virtue of the fact that his playing was so good. When he's, when he's doing what it is that he does, uh, I found myself having to rise to him yeah. you know and that's really how that's a, just an example of how a musician might change also there was Rob Moose who's a great string player came in and he was really transformative on the record he added he all the strings he added he added alone it was just him with a violin and uh, he really brought the some of the songs from being really good takes to like he uh, he put some magic in them you know and really made them quite regal in moments, so I really appreciate him. Nico Muley brought a, 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 a choir, the Brooklyn Youth Choir in and played the Celeste and had a flautist and he was doing things to the songs that I would never think of, you know, because I'm, in my experience, I'm so used to, you know, the, the instruments of, that would be in the frames, whereas yeah, he was bringing in all these other instruments. And of course, Thomas Bartlett, the guy who produced the record, he was, he was very much coming from the, Kind of almost Brian Eno-esque keyboard approach where everything was very somnambulistic and very kind of sleepy and so uh, it was 
those guys had a huge impact on the record. But you also write songs after that first session that, well, that maybe that they're playing and in your <coughs> experience with them on, on the first day influence your songwriting? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Like the song, uh, Maybe Not Tonight, which is the second song on the record. Uh, we had David Mansfield, who's an incredible slide guitar player, come in and I started playing a riff that I thought would work well with what he was playing and then I wrote the song. And so the song fell out that evening. And I was very proud of it because it just came in a, in a flash. So absolutely, they influenced the songwriting. And that's the stuff that's exciting for me because the stuff that I'm sitting at home with and kind of cultivating and, 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 and tightening, and that, that stuff is all, you know, very personal. And whereas some of the stuff they were doing, in the, we were doing in the studio as a band, as just a bunch of guys, uh, I found very exciting because it was very spontaneous. And so I'm glad that a couple of those songs made the record.